Humaira Shaheed, thank you so, so much for taking questions today from Lahore, Pakistan. Women Thrive has partnered with you a lot over the years, and you've been a real champion for women and girls in your country, including spearheading a resolution to recognize acid attacks as attempted murder when you were a member of the Punjab Provincial Assembly. So what can you tell us today about the scale of violence against women and girls in Pakistan and what's happening right now? Thank you very much uh, for having me today. Um, Pakistan is a very complicated place, and I would say on the one hand, we have this blatant violence in the form of rapes, we have social stigma, we have a patriarchal system. And, but on the other hand, what most people ignore is the structural violence in our systems. And one of the examples that I would like to give to you is the way uh, Sharia implementation is projected and is done in the Muslim countries. I think it's very critical. And I totally believe that Islam has been hijacked by radicals. And um, uh, because you see, Sharia has been taken out of context. And certain conditions of Sharia are very selectively used, which primarily focus on the sexual morality of women. Islam is not about cladding women in burqas or the way they show that the piety of a man depends upon the layers of the clothing of women. These and those people who do it, I call them Sharia power brokers. They're exploiting Islam. Sharia, if you want to talk about Sharia, then Sharia is 70% about economic dealings. It's about business transactions. It's about straight trade. It's about condemning the, the capitalist system uh, that usurps the wealth of others. It is about social injustice. Sharia is about the rights of the weak, rights of the poor, orphans, widows. And I believe Islam gave fundamental rights to women. And the kind of Islam that we have projected today in our countries, and especially in Pakistan, is totally what is against the teachings in the scriptures. For example, let me give you a, an example of female infanticides. Uh, honor killings are recognized as first degree murder in Islam. Slandering and false accusation are very severe punishments in Sharia, but nobody talks about that. The Sharia has been reduced to women, what they wear, how they look. It is all about external projection of women. And uh, uh, I mean, a lot of violence in Pakistan is about forced marriage. It is about, and uh, Islam does not actually, um, uh, you know, it cannot, it talks about women uh, who, Islam does not force women to be in an undesired marriage. And you cannot force a woman to marry somebody. Her consent is very important. So uh, coming back to violence in the, and where religion is used as a tool, Pakistan has a lot of complications there. One of the other pro uh, problems within the structure, structural systems is the, we have an Anglo-Saxon judicial system and which has a lot of technical and procedural flaws. And judicial process in Pakistan is so slow. It takes years for somebody, uh, an accused, to be convicted. And uh, they go through a lot of exploitation. Uh, the, the, the judiciary is corrupt itself. The police is corrupt. The implementation of law has interference from pol political uh, leaderships. So there are, so all these have become parasites. Money, bribes is huge. So I believe Pakistan, on the one hand, we have this blatant violence. On the other hand, we have this structural violence within the systems. And both need to be addressed. Have you seen any progress? What are the efforts that are making a difference for women? Well, the progress is in the last uh, 10 years, uh, Pakistan has seen uh, a lot of, uh, the Pakistan has been successful in making legislations against violence and harassment of women and minors. But the changes in the procedures and implementations of these laws is very superficial. Until the issue of violence is not a priority among the governments and long-term policies are not devised. Instead, what we have is we have short-term attention-seeking efforts. Uh, I don't think Pakistan uh, can curb the violence. Besides, I believe that women empowerment, uh, the, the whole debate on Sharia, uh, where Sharia is used as a tool, uh, this to be addressed and the system needs reforms because I believe that the violator has to be held accountable. The governments 
and authorities, the government departments who are who are supposed to enforce law, they should be held accountable. Corruption of the police and the judicial system should, needs to be addressed. And if we do not look into the reforms of the structural violence and exploitation, um, and, and, and I, I named three departments that need reforms, governments who make the laws and implement the laws, police which enforces the law, judiciary which gives justice. These three issues are very important and unless you don't have the reforms, just the laws itself are not enough to curb violence. You have been a longtime champion for the International Violence Against Women Act. Why do you care so much about seeing this legislation pass and the U.S. having a role in helping reduce violence against women in Pakistan and elsewhere? Well, uh, the first um, two questions, the way I answer it, because uh, I, I don't just see that individual cases of violence needs attention. I believe that the structures and the sy systemic changes are very important. I support IVAVA because it proposes a long time, a long term policy. It's talking about systemic changes. And by systemic changes, I mean fundamental reforms within the police, within the laws, within the judicial systems. Uh, IVAVA talks about preempting violence. It proposes a pa the parallel systems of economic empowerment, education, and health. Because violence happens in a certain circumstances. Without changing those circumstances, the security of women is not possible, and uh, without substantial financial uh, funding in the implementation of uh, mechanisms, one cannot deliver or reach these women. IWAWA is not only relevant for the women in the United States, IWAWA is also relevant to the conflict-owned regions where U.S. gives, uh, you know, donates money and invests in projects of violence against women, the financial aid for protection of women in all these years that have been given to Pakistan did not show the results that were required. I mean, all the, we had these huge fundings and I do not see on the ground that it has helped us curb the violence. In fact, the violence over the last few years has gone, uh, gone, uh, gone up. It has increased. So these financial, poli uh, financial aid and the policies do need an institu institutionalization, which is what IWAWA proposes. It needs long-term policies. It needs to address the circumstances, the cultural relativism be behind it. And you cannot deal violence and security of women in isolation. Education, health, security, um, women in economic empowerment, uh, judicial uh, reforms in the ju judicial system, reform in the police, reform in the legislative structures. This is what Arava is about. And that is why I keep on pressing. It is very relevant to all the conflict zone regions, all the regions where U.S. Uh, sends financial aid. So we know it's late in the evening for you right now. I think it's probably about 10, 10 30 your time. Um, in at night. So we'll wrap up by, by just asking, what do you think is the single best thing that American women and men can do to help support efforts like yours and those of others around the world who are fighting to end gender-based violence once and for all? Well, there are 101 reasons why violence against women is so prevalent in Pakistan. But America, which has better judicial systems, which has better police, uh, police and law enforcing institutions, uh, the uh, people are more educated, they are much more aware. I believe that the people of America should stand up. We should stand up for the security and against the violence uh, of women. IWAWA is something that is in the upper house, in the lower house, the Senate and the Congress of USA. It has been there for years and I prompt all the people who support uh, uh, the rights of the women, who want the security of the women, who talk about the protection of the women, who want to protect and honor their mothers, daughters, and sisters, they must get up. This legislation is not about uh, just raising your voice. It is, it is stepping forward and taking action. So I urge each one of you who's listening to me, each one of you who knows something about Avaiva, please go and uh, pressurize and plead and push forward uh, to your representatives in the House that they must address a long-term policy on IWAWA 
Um, violence, I believe, um, has no geographical or cultural boundaries. Um, the world is becoming a dangerous place, and it is much more um, dangerous to the vulnerable women and the minors. Well, why have we forgotten to respect and protect uh, our women? And women are not something that I should regard as something sexual. As I, I, I do not approve of all uh, the way media projects and glamorizes um, uh, violence. It is in our movies. It is in our video games. It is in the. It's, 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 it's a sort of a subliminal conditioning around us. So I believe that you can support um, in supporting Iwawa. You know, we'll also be helping the countries. The, like my country, the, where, where the conflict, these are conflict-owned regions. So I believe that we all must rise and we must go and, uh, and put our force and put our pressure and put our uh, best efforts uh, for a legislation like Iwawa, which addresses the, the issues of violence and security of women in a very comprehensive way. Thank you so much, Humera, for talking with us today and for all your great work on reducing violence against women and girls. We're with you in this, um, and it's such an important effort, so thank you. Thank you for having me.